Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to all of our, our partners today. Welcome to uh, the Housing Authority uh, launching and facilitating what is now known as the California Avenue Neighborhood, a choice neighborhood. We are honored to have you here today. Uh, we have a rich agenda, a very full agenda, so we're going to move very uh, expeditiously and very intentionally throughout our day uh, to open us up and to bring opening remarks and welcome you all today. I have our our uh, current CEO, uh, who unfortunately <laughs> unfortunately is leaving us rather soon, uh, Preston Prince, who will begin our day today. Again, thank you for joining. My name is Tiffany Mangum. I am your project manager for this work, and I'm honored to serve here in the Fresno community. Preston? Thank you, Tiffany, and welcome uh, to the HUD team that is, uh, is virtually joining us uh, here in Fresno. We are really excited to be meeting with you. We have um, a, a, a fantastic lineup of community leaders uh, to talk about what's happening in West Fresno. Um, and I just have two quick comments that I'd like to make, uh, and then we'll be uh, introducing folks. Um, and the first is that we see this as a transformation uh, from within. And what I mean by that is that this is within the community. There are so many people who are on this team um, who are from West Fresno, who went to Edison High School. And if they're not from uh, West Fresno or, or didn't go to Edison, they are from the Valley. They're from Fresno City, Fresno County, they're from places uh, Stockton down to Bakersfield. Um, this is the community participating in a transformation of a, uh, of a really historically important uh, community of Fresno. And so this is uh, definitely a team approach uh, and that's really embedded also within how we're approaching this. This is not a housing authority led process. This is a community led process on the transformation of West Fresno, the reinvestment uh, and uh, into a community that has had a little, little too much disinvestment over the, the last few decades. Uh, and then uh, we have augmented our team um, with some really talented people that we'll be introducing you to who are also helping us really make sure that this is about engaged <coughs> community members at the forefront of the transformation. Um, and so I'm really looking forward and want to thank uh, Dr. Thomas and her team at Thrivance and Ray Parks and her team at EJP. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that we see this as not just the transformation of West Fresno, we see this as the transformation of Fresno housing. That we have been working the last 13 years to become a much different organization, one that is, uh, has moved away from compliance to really uh, be a um, entrepreneurial organization and a community asset. And so the lessons we learned through the choice neighborhood planning process uh, about how we engage our community members is going to be guiding us as we uh, pursue developments in Fireball and Huron and all of the rest of Fresno County. Uh, so this is a transformation about how we do business. Um, and the reason why we're able to transform uh, both communities as well as our agencies because of the leadership of our organization. And at the top, uh, we, uh, we have a city uh, housing authority and a county housing authority that operate as one as Fresno Housing. And I'd like to introduce to you uh, our two chairs uh, and I'll, I'll do them together and then let them speak up. Uh, Chair Jones has been uh, her first meeting as a commissioner was my first meeting as a housing authority director 13 and a half years ago. Um, her personal story is an amazing one of, um, uh, of uh, growing up through our programs, uh, not growing up, but uh, uh, being able to take advantage of, of a housing choice voucher, first joined as a resident commissioner um, and after becoming a homeowner and getting her master's degree, um, she was appointed by the mayor uh, at that time for a regular spot on the board, a non-commissioner spot. Um, and uh, so she's gonna say a few words and then uh, Commissioner Catalano, Chair Catalano's on the county side. He has been a social uh, advocate uh, for uh, Fresno County um, his whole career. And he's also going to be able to talk about how the housing authorities work together to transform communities. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chair Jones. 
Thank you, Preston. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Adrienne Jones. And on behalf of the city and county of Fresno Housing Authority, welcome to our neighborhood. As we begin today's celebration, and it is a celebration, after years of hearing about three Ps, I'm going to take a few moments to highlight a few A's that I want you to think about today. I'm going to jump right in. And our first A is action, which is what we are doing today. By definition, it means the fact or process of doing something. And one of my life philosophies have always been, don't talk about it, be about it. Born here in Fresno, my parents from Fresno, um, I grew up in the Westgate Apartments. My mom is a class of 1965 Edison Tiger. So you see California Avenue is truly my neighborhood. Sometimes it appears that I'm a little in the background, maybe not as boisterous as most, but believe me, I have been like that little nagging mosquito in <laughs> Preston's ear for the past 10 to 13 years when it comes to Southwest Fresno. I'm very excited and proud of our successful developments that our staff and team have developed in the past uh, 10 years over in the 93706 zip code. Our Yosemite Village, which if Fresnans know, used to be our California Corches. Our Bridges of Florence, which Fresnans know used to be a pond. Um, our Legacy Commons. So we, we have done some work. We've been working for years, but we'd also have been talking for years, at least 10. And so as an agency, we have been trying to put together a comprehensive plan for this area for a long time. But today is the day of action. And at this time, I would like to give a special shout out to our very own Miss Tiffany Mangum for her leadership, her representation, not only for this agency, but for the people of this area. And I applaud her tenacity and her ability to foster, nurture, and maintain some of the partnerships and collaborations that make today available. We have finally stopped talking about it and we have started to be about it. The next A that I will quickly go over is accessibility. Access to many amenities for these families will include fresh fruit and vegetables, fresh poultry, meat and seafood, green space, mixed use housing of opportunities, higher education. As been said, these are truly things to transform lives. Our last A is a word that is typically overused hand in hand with accessibility. And it should not be because it is very independent. And that is affordability. Case in point, employer paid medical insurance. Your employer may pay 100% of your medical insurance, but if your copay is $35 to go to the doctor, if you need to pay $50 for x-ray or $50 for blood work, then though you have access to go, can you afford a $200 doctor bill every time you go? So I don't want to be a buzzkill. <laughs> we are at a neighborhood celebration, right? Family, right? And no family celebration is complete without some unpleasant news. That aunt, that aunt's hip surgery, dad's affair, sister's divorce, all part of the balance that is life. So in closing, and as we move forward in today's celebration, I want to leave you with some statistics to remember. According to the statistics at neighborhoodlink.com, the median household income in the United States right now is about $50,000 a year. The median family income in the 93706 zip code is $23,399 a year. Interestingly, men, earn $22,964,000 a year in that zip code. In addition, at zipcode.org, the educational attainment for the population of 25 years and over, less than high school diploma is 42.6%. High school graduate is 44.6%. I want us to think about that impact on accessibility for a second. 87.2% of individuals over 25 years old in the zip code of 93706 
have a high school diploma or less and earns $23,000 or less. So please, let's remember that providing access to something that a neighborhood can't afford is just asinine. It's another A. So let's be energized with our actions, mindful in our access, and diligent in our affordability. And with that, again, welcome to our neighborhood. Absolutely awesome. Chair Catalano. Uh, uh, I'm very fortunate enough to have the opportunity to sit next to Ms. Jones. We haven't sat next to each other with the pandemic. She's an amazing community leader. I wanna thank you for your thoughtful comments. Thank you to Tiffany and thank you to the entire Fresno Housing Authority team. For me, it's really about granting equal access to all, all great things life has to offer. Many people don't know I grew up in a very impoverished household. My mom worked three jobs to put a roof over our head. I put myself through college. Many of us have the same story to tell, but not all of us have access to equal opportunity. I was very fortunate to have access to mentors, to teachers, and to opportunities to be where I am today in business for myself and to sit here with you. One of my first jobs when I graduated uh, from college was at the community food bank. I was in charge of the emergency food distribution program, and I never quite understood why West Fresno was not invested in heavily. It made no sense to me that the highest need of emergency food was concentrated in one area, why the streets and sidewalks were in disrepair, why the street lights didn't work, why crime was so high in West Fresno. I said, what is this all about? And I just really didn't know. And why I'm excited to be here today, it's about all of us coming together for that word action, to, to bring our resources together, to impact the neighborhoods, to give them everything they deserve because we are one city. North Fresno shouldn't have all the great amenities, all of Fresno should have, about, have all the great amenities. And I'm really honored to be here with all of you. I'm grateful for the leadership of the mayor, uh, council member Arias, and so many others that are actually fighting the good fight, not just talking about action, they're doing the good work. And I just wanted to say thank you for being the champions for all of Fresno and I'm just honored to be here with all of you today. Thank you, Tiffany and Preston. Nathan, I think it's time for you to introduce your team and then I'll introduce the Housing Authority team and. Sounds good, thank you, Preston. Uh, and just first off, before I say anything else, congratulations. Yeah, you all you. Um, were awarded a grant in one of the most competitive um, grant competitions we've had uh, in some time. There are 50 applications, um, 11 cities were selected, including Fresno. So first off, just thank you uh, and congratulations. Uh, thank you for applying to our program and believing in our model as well. Um, just as much as we believe in what you are, are um, about to embark on. So I'm Nathan Mishler. I'm uh, one of the neighborhood and community investment specialists with the Choice Neighborhoods team. And I will be your team coordinator uh, throughout the, the next two years as you go through this process together. Um, and I know uh, Eunice Berry is here and then also Janelle Baker. Eunice, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, Nathan. Uh, good afternoon, good morning for West Coast folks. Um, Eunice Barry, I am also uh, with the Choice Neighborhood Team. I'm going to be your housing specialist for the duration of this planning grant. Uh, looking forward to meeting everybody um, today and tomorrow, and of, of, obviously, uh, hopefully, sometime in the 24 months planning process to to be able to meet a uh, person in person. Um, and looking forward to learning from you today and as much as possible so we can uh, better guide, help, and serve you. Thank you, Nisa. Janelle? Hi, I'm Janelle Baker, and I am new to Choice Neighborhood at HUD, and I'm here to help out Nathan and Eunice um, with everything. I'm really interested to join the team my first time ever visiting California <laughs> virtually. So I'm looking forward to all the, the touring today. But thank you for having me. Great. So excited to meet the HUD team. And um, I'm going to introduce the, uh, the, the Housing Authority team real quick. Uh, so the, our, our 
uh, recently appointed interim CEO and also our chief uh, program officer, Angie Wynn is with us. Our chief business officer, Emily De La Guerra is with us. Our chief of real estate, um, uh, overseeing both property management, asset management and development, Michael Duarte is with us. Um, but in addition, we have so many other team, uh, team members, Tiffany Mangum, who's the project lead. Uh, we have um, Daniel Guerra, who's within the development department. We have Aja um, uh, and Lucinda who have joined us uh, and Z, uh, Aja Cruz and Lucinda Walls. And um, we have, uh, I, I was trying to go through quickly, Kelly Furtado's in our communications and, and our uh, community uh, 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 programs. Um, anyways, so uh, I know I just missed some people. I totally apologize because I feel like we're a little behind schedule already. Uh, of course, that was me saying too much. And with that, I'd like to turn it over. Um, Ray, if you'd like to introduce your team that's here. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Preston. So my name is Ray Parks and um, I work with EJP Consulting Room and we have the great, great honor to support the Housing Authority and uh, local planning partners as the planning coordinator. Because we are running behind schedule already, I'm not gonna introduce everybody by name, but I do wanna just give a shout out to two of our core partners that are on the phone on this um, live stream. We've got Thrivens, who you will hear from in a little bit, and they're going to uh, help with the um, very robust and sustained community engagement work that will be necessary uh, for this effort. And then we also have LAS, who's going to be helping us with the design and neighborhood planning services. But we're delighted to be here. And really we see our job as really sort of supporting the housing authority and uh, residents and community get to a plan and a vision that reflects community voice and what everybody agrees are the priorities for this neighborhood. So thank you for this opportunity and welcome, welcome, welcome. We're really, really excited to have uh, EJP Th uh, Thrivance and LAS with us. Um, and so I am really excited to make an introduction to, uh, to the HUD team and to the whole, everyone watching uh, on the live stream, um, Mayor Dyer. And uh, Mayor Dyer uh, had the um, great opportunity of being elected in March of last year. So uh, he had nine months to plan. And, and so when I say he hit the ground running in January, he just had a lot of run up to that hitting the ground, but he has hit the ground running. Um, he's got so many major initiatives that uh, align with what's happening, including addressing black wealth um, here in Fresno County, 75% of black uh, Fresnans have zero or negative wealth. And so I know 93706 is at the top of his list uh, of communities. And um, this is the kind of work that he really champions. Mayor Dyer. Well, thank you, uh, Preston. And, and uh, congratulations to, uh, to the, our housing authority and agency for receiving this award. Uh, it's my honor to represent the, the people of Fresno and uh, to also welcome our, our HUD friends. And uh, thank you for, for recognizing and choosing Fresno. You know, I have a, a vision for, for our community. And it's a vision that I, I gathered from conversations with a lot of people in Fresno in terms of what they want of a community. And they want an inclusive, prosperous, beautiful city where people take pride in their neighborhood and their community. And that word inclusive is so important to me because it, it means that uh, everyone should have the same opportunities to be successful in life. Everyone should have an opportunity to own a home. Everyone should have an opportunity to have a good job and to be able to provide for their family. And so um, I think sometimes that word inclusive is left out. And when we talk about transformation, you know, we keep hearing about transforming uh, the Golden West Side, transforming uh, 93706. How do we, what is transformation? And for me, it is when, when, when the old things have passed away mm -hmm. and all things become new. And that means a new way to approach things, 
uh, a new way to, to, to see things, looking through the eyes of other people. Uh, and until we do that as a society, until we recognize what it's like to be homeless, uh, we're not going to have the, the passion we need as a community to provide homes for people. I just spent this morning out there at the, in, in West Fresno uh, at, the, at the Golden, at the Triangle there and uh, meeting with individuals who are homeless, been homeless for years, uh, do not have a roof over their head. Well, today, thanks to our partnership with the Housing Authority and others, uh, we're relocating those individuals into housing with services so that they can be productive and that they can transition into permanent housing at some point in time. And so what, what, what you're doing today and what we're going to do in the future is so important to our city. And I just wanna say thank you uh, to all of you for caring, caring about Fresno, choosing Fresno, and we're, uh, we're grateful to be a partner and uh, congratulations to you guys, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. Uh, I do wanna say I have a dog that's snoring in the background. So if you hear snoring, I'm not asleep. I apologize up front. Mayor Dyer, this is great to have your leadership in, in partnership with us. Um, and we're also very lucky to have council member Arias, um, who uh, again, this is, uh, and I know uh, Mayor Dyer, you're born and raised in Fresno, yes? Yes. Um, Miguel was born and raised. I, we're going to call Mendota Fresno. He was born and raised in Fresno as well. And this is all about, uh, as I said, Fresnans, um, thinking of answers and solutions for Fresnans. Uh, Miguel, please. Thank you, Preston. Um, and just for the context for the Housing Authority uh, folks and for the HUD folks, I am the younger, better version of Mayor Dyer. So just so that we're all clear, my job is to make him look good and to keep him on track on reaching the one Fresno goal that we have as a city, but uh, making sure that the meat and, and uh, the meat's on the bones um, and that the commitments are real and that our policy priorities are aligned. So just some really quick background. West Fresno, if you had to write a history book about a disfranchised community that was redlined and that was the epicenter of racism in a, in a whole region, West Fresno would be that community. So we have a lot of injustices to correct over the next few years. And I find myself like Mayor Dyer, constantly apologizing for what wasn't done in previous years. And, you know, Fresno has a history of, you know, equalness. Everybody gets the same share of the pie resources, even though our needs are completely different. So um, we've been spending quite a bit of time on aligning policies. We now have a Southwest Pacific plan but more importantly, we have a displacement plan to ensure that as we reinvest in West Fresno, we don't push people out of West Fresno, especially those that want to remain there. And that displacement plan was approved by the council. So we're on the hook to follow through with those commitments to ensure that housing, new housing, rehab housing, small business investment, infrastructure, and homelessness is all done in a way that's um, reflective of, of that value to engage in equitable reinvestment. Um, this world of everybody gets the same is not how we're gonna make up for decades of um, previous um, lack of deinvestment or, or deinvestment that took place. Um, just a really quick highlights on what we've done so far. We have complete alignment finally with some major areas of the city and in West Fresno. It starts off with our transformative climate change investment by the state, millions of dollars of new money going into reinvesting in West Fresno. That includes a brand new college campus. We've never had one. So mm -hmm. kids, we used to be bused out thanks to you know desegregation of schools. We're bused out across the city. Um, now you can go to Head Start and college in your neighborhood. Uh, new parks, renovations of all our community centers thanks to passage of a uh, Measure P of uh, citywide bond. So all the five community centers in West Fresno will finally get their renovation, the investment that they've needed for 30 years. A new medical clinic in West Fresno, thanks to the city funded medical clinic. First time our city has ever funded a medical clinic anywhere. But the pandemic demonstrated to us through evidence and through deaths of people that when there's a gap in healthcare services and access, people die, especially in a, when a, a pandemic hits. We've opened up new housing for seniors so that people can remain in West Fresno if they wanna stay in West Fresno. Um, it's all affordable. 
We have our first market rate housing that people have been asking for for generations. So now if you want a single family home and you want to live in West Fresno, you'll have the same opportunity that you have in any part of the city. Um, the, the next big portions of alignment will come through not just the improvements and the funding of Measure P, our parks initiative, but also the nearly $200 million that we received in the federal relief package of President Biden. How that money is reinvested equitably is going to make a difference. And also the renewal of our Measure P, our Measure C transit um, a, a bond that we engage in. Um, how we fund public transit and connectivity is going to matter. Around opportunities and challenges, I want to be crystal clear. I tend to be pretty direct. And I know I make some people cringe at times, mayor and president, so uh, apologies on their behalf. But the real opportunities for us has been around finally getting on the same page on the policy. The underlying policy must be there in order for us to convince folks to reinvest. Then we must get in alignment with resources. The city, the housing authority, uh, we're finally in alignment with the amount of resources needed in West Fresno. And then finally, the city leadership, you know, we all promise um, to fix things, to do our best, but we have a mayor and a council now that are committing to that reinvestment. You know, we, we've never had a mayor that walked into a homeless encampment before and talked to people. We've never had a mayor that showed up to an intersection where people lost their lives because there was no infrastructure for that intersection. So when we talk about safe routes to schools and sidewalks for kids, it, it's no longer just a soundbite, it's real. Um, but the challenges still exist, right? Concentrated poverty. We have the highest concentration of poverty of any zip code in the country. That's real. We have a lot of the congregate work settings. The poultry plants that kept your, uh, your food shelves full is in West Fresno, in our district, right? They're also the most vulnerable. We have more brownfields in West Fresno than any other part of the city. Those are immensely expensive to fix and to build on. We have a lack of infrastructure. I still have schools that don't have sidewalks in front of them. Way too many schools that don't have sidewalks in front of them. We have roads that haven't been, re been, been repaved in 50 years because it's cheaper to fix the road that's five years old than the one that needs to be completely reconstructed, right? You go from 50 cents a square feet to $7.50 so that equal reinvestment was never gonna catch up parts of the, of the city, especially in West Fresno. With that said, we, we're ready for that public and private um, investment and we're in, intentionally implementing that public and private investment, but it will matter. The implementation will matter and HUD is part of that solution. How we reinvest, where we reinvested, what Fresno Unified and other school districts have to do to you know, manage the additional population that we're gonna generate with the energy and the vibrancy of those neighborhoods. So at the end of the day, um, the most important part is that the historical injustice is at the forefront of every decision we make and it's gonna have to direct the equitable reinvestment that we make in West Fresno. And for the next at least four years, you have complete alignment in city leadership to do that in every decision we make. And welcome to the California Avenue neighborhood of West Fresno. My name is Tiffany Mangum, your project manager. Welcome. Welcome to Southwest Fresno's California Avenue neighborhood. Southwest Fresno is rich with history, culture, and a former thriving centerpiece of agriculture, business, community, and opportunity. Historically, Southwest Fresno has been home to migrant and immigrant communities, including Italian farm workers who owned much of the land, leasing it to our Chinese rural workers. As the Great Migration began in the early 1900s, a large number of African Americans began to migrate from the southern states to other parts of the country, including Fresno, to escape the racism of the South and seek new opportunities in education and in jobs such as sharecropping. In the 1940s, as part of the Bracero program to address the labor shortages caused by World War II, 
Fresno began to see a growing population of Mexican workers and farmers who contributed to the growing agricultural industry of the Central Valley. Southwest Fresno became home to many immigrant communities with strong agrarian backgrounds. And after several generations, making Southwest Fresno one of the most diverse communities in our city today. In 1942, the Housing Authority of the City of Fresno began constructing housing for Fresno residents and over the next 52 years would add more than 200 low-income public housing units. The last of these units being located at DeSoto Gardens and being constructed in 1994. The oldest of these sites is coming up on 80 years and are meeting functional obsolescence as our community vision is to transform the Southwest Fresno, California Avenue neighborhood into a mixed income, mixed use community. The Housing Authority's initial steps in Southwest Fresno include a RAD transfer of assistance for 46 households from Sierra Terrace to Legacy Commons, one of our newest housing communities with amenities such as a community center, swimming pool, a community recording studio and performing arts hub, and additional recreational areas for our children and youth. Southwest Fresno has a rich history as one of Fresno's first neighborhoods, home of the historic Edison High School and our Edison Tigers. A strong and rich history of opportunity and it thrives on its sense of pride and family. With the adoption of the city's general plan, the downtown neighborhood's community plan, the Southwest Fresno specific plan, and the numerous transformative climate communities projects launching in Southwest, the California Avenue neighborhood is yet poised to be reimagined and redeveloped as a vibrant and economically prosperous neighborhood with opportunities for all. Thank you, C-Mac, for helping us with that welcoming video. Um, this is not a Fresno housing only initiative. This is a community-wide initiative with so many partners, and I'd like to introduce two of those partners. The first is our Fresno Economic Opportunity Commission, EOC, and Emilio Reyes. Thank you, um, Preston. Um, first, I want to say happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. Um, today is actually a celebration and a great way to start off um, this great project because not only do we have luck behind us, we have that positive energy. And so, um, like Preston said, my name is Amelia Reyes and I have the honor and privilege to serve as the CEO of Fresno EOC. Our agency was birthed out of the civil rights movement. And by definition, we are a community action agency and to support specifically these types of initiatives to provide opportunities for people in need. And we recognize with these disparities and this pandemic only has magnified and highlighted the disparities specifically in our most concentrated poverty areas. Um, not only, and we're here to strive to create equitable opportunities in our community. And I would love to brag about all the great work that we're doing in Southwest Fresno, but I'm gonna give the credit where the credit is due. And now I want, I'm proud to introduce our Chief Administrative Officer, Heather Brown, who's been leading our work uh, specifically in Southwest Fresno to share some of our programs and services available in this area. Thank you, Amelia, and thank you to Tiffany and Preston and the entire Fresno housing um, community. We really appreciate this opportunity to share with you today and honor uh, your achievement uh, with this grant. I do wanna just spend a little bit of time thinking about, talking about uh, with you the services that we provide in Southwest Fresno. And I do wanna stress the fact that yes, we are providing services, but our, um, at, our, our, at our 
our base um, motivation is to power build in the communities that we serve. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that we have been doing very effectively with support from the county and the city, thank you, uh, Mayor Dyer, and particularly uh, Councilman Arias for your support over the last year uh, in our response to uh, COVID. Uh, currently, we are running a very successful vaccination clinic in uh, middle school, Gaston Middle School in uh, Southwest Fresno. We are um, currently really outpacing all other vaccination clinics in terms of vaccination of African Americans and other um, people of color. And so we're very proud of that work and proud of the uh, way that we've been able to serve the community throughout the pandemic. You saw in that video some of our programs, one of which was the Local Conservation Corps. Uh, we've been running the core just off of California and B Streets, uh, pay, uh, providing skills training and education to uh, youth uh, through public lands um, uh, training, through recycling training, uh, through solar installation. We also have a LIHEAP uh, uh, utility assistance um, program has a site in Southwest Fresno, and so we're help. We're very helpful. Uh, happy to help people uh, when they need that kind of assistance. One of our newest programs is Advanced Peace Fresno, which is a gun violence reduction program, which we launched in 2020. Uh, we are so excited to see how in partnership with the city uh, and with the police department, we can reduce gun violence in all areas of Fresno, but particularly in the Southwest. Uh, we also provide gang violence reduction through Street Saints, uh, which is run out of one of those community centers that uh, Council Member Arias uh, discussed, uh, the South, uh, the Sunset Community Center. Um, they have been providing for the last decade youth intervention and gang um, uh, intervention uh, in our communities. We uh, provide food distribution at a number of sites. We recently, again, with the city, partnered with the city um, to provide additional food distribution because of the pandemic in Southwest Fresno. And so we've done that through um, churches, Westside Church of God, St. Rest EDC, uh, uh, nonprofits, Fresno United, West Fresno Family Resource Center, and Stones of the Community, really to shore up people's um, food and to shore up people's food security during the pandemic. You also saw in the video that we have Head Start centers in um, West Fresno, and we have been, our agency has been leading Head Start in the in Fresno County for the last 55 years. And so we are proud of that. We're proud to serve the community in that way. Um, additionally, some of the other things, the services that we provide are uh, solar installation and weatherization for homes in Southwest Fresno. Uh, we are proud to help people uh, transform uh, their energy usage. So I just want to, um, that there's so many other things that uh, we are doing in West Fresno and that uh, I want for you, and I know Emilia will probably say this as well, but we are committed to this community. We are committed to power building in this community. We are committed to changing all of those statistics that we've heard about. Um, for the last 30 minutes in West Fresno. Uh, and so we're glad to be a partner with you. Awesome, I realize we need to be tweeting about this, hashtag power building, I love that. Uh, uh, our focus uh, is always around housing, but it's for health, wealth, and educational outcomes. Uh, uh, 15 or more percent of the students uh, at Fresno Unified, live in Fresno Housing Authority subsidized or assisted housing. And so one of our great partners is Fresno Unified. And we are really excited to, I'm excited to introduce Superintendent Bob Nelson. Thanks, Preston. And thanks to our HUD partners. Appreciate that. And appreciate you being here and kind of paying it forward in Fresno. Um, thankful for people like Trusty Arias served with us for the better part of a decade. Like, one thing you learn about Fresno, our family tree doesn't fork a lot. It's the same people doing the same heavy lifting uh, every day, all the time. The chief before he was the, sorry, I refer to him as a chief. The mayor before he was the mayor was the chief of police. So we have a lot of history and I'm 
very thankful to serve as the first internal candidate to serve as Fresno Unified Superintendent in about three decades. So I've been here about 30 years. Um, and we have a, you know, we need, we realize that education is kind of the answer for Southwest Fresno in many ways. As, as Preston talked about, we have a shared population, obviously uh, yeah, you know, almost a third of um, our students in the system and sometime or another have participated as, as clients of the housing authority. And so obviously we share a history of generational folks living in subsidized housing and education is the ticket to creating change there. Uh, so creating some unique educational goals for Southwest. As you heard, Trustee Arias is well served on the State Center Community College Board at a time that we're able to put a institution of higher education across from Gaston Middle School, which you just heard about from our partners at EOC, where we're providing the vaccination clinic. It's a relatively new middle school um, after we bust out middle school kids from Southwest Fresno for the better part of three decades prior to that too. It's a beautiful new facility there. Uh, but one of our commitments is to get every single one of our kids as they graduate 12 to 15 college units so that they get transcripted credit ahead of time because we, you know, you heard some of the demographic statistics early on, which is that, you know, high school graduation attainment has been difficult, let alone degree attainment in this community. So how do we help our kids have their own teachers and have a dual enrollment with state center so that all of our kids graduate with the understanding that not only are they college material, but they have transcripted credit to show it that they're already well on their way. They're like a year into school with 12 to 15 units of college credit, which will save them time, money, and give them more over the commitment that they know that they are college material. Um, we're doubling down in terms of our early learning expansion into that region as well, the Levera Williams Center nearby, but not just providing early learning, um, which 93706 residents have been underserved in, but also a high quality of program, a relationship with the EOC and our local Head Start. Um, just a lot of connected tissue with some of the partners that you heard about already. Uh, we're thankful in the pandemic as we pushed the schooling into the homes of our residents that the housing authority has been a partner for us because if you don't have bandwidth, for example, you don't have school. And so just, and I think quite honestly, post COVID, like you're not going to get technology out of the hands or kids, teachers, like it's, it's a permanent change. It just as the airport changed after 9-11, you can pretty well assure yourself post-COVID um, schooling will have changed. And we will have blurred the line with um, housing and parents and them being a much more educated consumer of the education product. And that's not liable to change. So we have a joint thing. Not only is, you know, the housing authority providing access to Wi-Fi, but and the district is also buying bandwidth, unused bandwidth across Southwest Fresno with the hope of providing universal Wi-Fi access for everybody in that entire region. Um, it's really about community collaboration. I, I'm just thankful to HUD for selecting us in this thing. The one thing you can assure yourself with is that, you know, Fresnans are committed. It's kind of gritty in some ways, you know, this is, uh, we're beautiful in our complexity, but it's uh, kind of a, uh, knows the grindstone people who are willing to put time sweat equity into Fresno and improving Fresno um, are all in and you hear that from the people in this call because our work just touches each other in so many other ways so the district stands ready uh, to support with our schools in the re in the region and to make sure that um, our kids there have every opportunity to succeed so as as the community improves, making sure that the educational attainment also is improving commensurate with that and lifting all tides so anyway thankful to be with you today. Dr. Nelson, thank you. I think now's the time for the ukulele and the song. Are you ready? No, um, let's not. Uh, let's not. You're, you just got the grant. I don't really think you want to put that to the test immediately by, uh, you know, maybe sharing too much. There is a thing. There called we go. So um, I, I, as the uh, as the MC of this beginning part, uh, I, I want to um, I, I skipped over the opportunity for the our, our guests from HUD to ask any questions or comments, but I thought if we can get through some of the introductions and, um, that you can ask questions of any of our speakers and, um, and then following that, uh, Commissioner Sabrina Kelly will continue with our orientation uh, of West Fresno and then Ray will uh, uh, talk a little bit more about our project timeline. So turning it back to you, Nathan, um, do you guys and Janelle and Yunisa, do you have any questions or comments that you'd like to do, make with the the first round of guests or speakers? Are you Yunisa? 
Nathan, I'll take your leave, but I do have I do have a question, uh, sort of a comment, maybe just to clarify. Um, uh, I, I heard from uh, the doctor Bob Nelson uh, how the school district is doubling down uh, what is expected to be a permanent setup post COVID, uh, the use of technology. Uh, I guess my question is maybe we'll hear more later about that. Uh, my question is. Um, the, what, what, what I keep remembering is one of the words that the, the young lady mentioned earlier, access is one of them. So if you're doubling down, does that mean everybody will have access to those types of technology that we know are going to be necessary for the young kids post pandemic? That's my question. So we can answer that later on or we can answer that now. I can just take a little stab at that. Thank you for the question. One, we were not a one-to-one -one district on March 13th of 2019, or excuse me, 2020. Um, so we put out 80,000 devices between, in this last year, 80,000 devices have hit the street and most of them hit the street before August, um, which, and I'm not, and nobody is necessarily advocating and saying distance learning is the companion, is, is equal and opposite what folks can get in schools with the teacher, but obviously having access to the tools is really a key. Um, our housing authority has worked very, very hard to make sure that everybody within their sphere has active access every day all the time. But one of the things we are doing too is working with local providers to actually buy up unutilized bandwidth and for the district to be an internet service provider so that everybody in this area, 93706, has access to who is a Fresno Unified student or family member or staff member would have access to Wi-Fi every day all the time, kind of at our expense. Just to make, because I just think that reality is not going away. I think how we, I mean, this meeting is probably indicative of what might happen in the future. I think we're going to travel a lot less in the future. We're going to have a lot more, like the shame or whatever, the stigma associated from telecommuting is largely gone. And so I think just helping our kids be prepared for that is absolutely crucial uh, post pandemic. I, I, I think there's no shame to teleworking. We, we love teleworking here. <laughs> Unisa says that we're all, all three of us are in different locations. Yeah, I think Unisa is in Baltimore. I'm near DC and Janelle is in Virginia somewhere. Yeah. And, and we're gonna, we're gonna uh, definitely spend a lot more time on uh, digital issues um, as part of the presentation because I think it's one of our initial projects. Sounds good. Thank you, Anissa. And I have uh, less of a question. I know um, we'll dive a little bit deeper into the three different components of um, the planning process and, and, and uh, the Choice Neighborhoods program. Um, but just, uh, Preston, I just really appreciated what you said about sort of um, changing sort of, um, maybe it's the culture or the, the lens of how the Housing Authority was interacting with residents from compliance to being sort of more around transformation. And that's sort of how we, we try to view or want to view our program as really trying to help enable really locally driven, robust plans to transform and revitalize a neighborhood that has been disinvested by the federal government, um, local governments across the board throughout history um, and through the private markets. And so we, we are just really excited to see the different um, really committed partners um, just having uh, different um, council members, commissioners, and the mayor on the call just speaks volumes. Um, we don't see that in every one of our cities. So um, we're just really looking forward to be working with you um, and know to, to see us as a partner. Um, I know sometimes when you interact with uh, the federal government or HUD, it's sometimes not a good thing. Uh, and we want to be seen as partners with you all um, and see us more as sort of a sounding board to help um, you all succeed in this planning process because our, our program succeeds when you all um, succeed and, and figure out how to, how to really sort of crack this nut um, of, of really trying to transform uh, an area that's really been uh, struggling and ha has um, a lot of challenges, but also many, many assets and strengths. Yeah, and I know that uh, when we spend some time with Dr. Thomas, she's going to talk about how uh, she's supercharging our work, but we've been thinking about engaged residents for years, and uh, I don't know, uh, Angie, can I put you on the spot to maybe um, and, uh, address very quickly this concept of engaged residents at the heart of our work? 
Sure. Yes. Um, you know, I was just actually making myself a note for something that I want tomorrow when I speak tomorrow. But, um, you know, I this was something that in I, I participated in a Dignity Institute that um, Dr. Destiny Thomas put on a, a couple of months ago. And one of the things that, you know, always stood out was to make sure that, you know, we're not always focused on the negative, but also focusing on the strengths of, of a community and to always um, learn from the people who can teach us about the history. So when we talk about the disinvestment, you know, we, we, this is an opportunity for us to learn from, from the residents on how to correct some of those wrongs um, and not necessarily say, here's how we're gonna fix you. It's like, it's more about how it can help us, help us understand what it is that you need, but also help us understand the culture and the history and your, you know, how we can uplift the community rather than just come in and say, okay, we're gonna fix you. So I think that that's um, a, a, a way that we want to approach this and make sure that, yes, we have a lot of great partners in the community that are service providers, but our, our priority and the partner that I really elevate to the top is our residents. Our residents are our primary partners in this work. Thank you, Angie. Put me in the spot, Preston. No, I know, but I knew you're gonna you're gonna emphasize what I think makes us unique and special. So thank you. And with that, I, I'd like to get back to our, our our program and Commissioner Sabrina Kelly. Are you ready to talk a little bit more about orientation to West Fresno? Southwest yes. Fresno. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Preston, and thank you, Tiffany, um, for that introduction. Um, just, um, you know, want to start by saying very, um, very excited about uh, the CAN neighborhood work. It has been a lifelong effort in my family to revitalize West Fresno as both of my paternal grandparents, one was an architect, one was a builder, did a lot of work in Southwest Fresno to improve quality housing and overall quality of life. And I'm not sure if you all see the, the PowerPoint slides, um, but, but wanted to begin with some of the photos um, that, that were um, made privy to me by a local uh, photographer who um, has uh, captured the history of Southwest Fresno and many of these, um, I'll share the link with you all later so that you can take a look at these, but really wanted to communicate the origin of segregation. So we're here, of course, to celebrate the uh, CAN work and the, and the planning process for CAN. And um, many of those who were before me kind of unpack the history, but I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the start or the founding or the establishment of the city of Fresno and how the segregation of Fresno created West Fresno as we know it. So in the um, late 1800s, uh, city of, uh, excuse me, yeah, the late 1800s city of Fresno was founded by the Central Pacific Railroad. And as a result of that, uh, the city of Fresno was originally inhabited by Anglo immigrants, but also by the Chinese immigrants who worked the railroads. And as the city grew, the immigrant population grew. And so the, um, the dominant culture in the city got together and held an informal meeting about, you know, how, how are we going to organize the city in a way that we are keeping what they called um, less desirable populations or lower grade populations. And you'll see this in the historical maps, the wordings that I posted here. How are we gonna keep the lower grade populations segregated from the rest of the city? So the Chinese immigrants were allowed to stay in the city of Fresno as long as they agreed to live west of the railroad tracks. And with that informal agreement, Chinatown was created. So Chinatown became 
it's trauma in Southwest Fresno for many immigrants as they moved here, either from other countries to work in the agricultural industry or like the African-American uh, immigrants, the black immigrants who left the rural South, who left the racial terror of Jim Crow to come to the North for more opportunity. So uh, this is uh, an area that's rich with history of immigrants, rich with history of agricultural work, and as, as a consequence, also rich with the history of segregation, high concentration of poverty, uh, and low opportunity neighborhoods. So if we can go to the next slide, we can kind of take a look at the map um, that was created. So in this map, you see um, really how these informal agreements were formalized with realty compacts and also with, uh, with uh, real, realty opportunity maps that highlighted these informal agreements not to rent and sell properties to ethnic minority groups west of the railroad tracks. So areas were deemed uh, favorable or detrimental based on influences. And as I mentioned before, those influences were foreign born, um, Negro uh, migrants and lower grade populations. So I wanna pause here because this is actually a photo of my family. This is the Kelly family. Uh, this is not all the siblings because there were, there were 12 of them, but you see my grandfather on the left, his brother, Jack Kelly on the right, who were trailblazers. Uh, Jack Kelly was the first African-American sergeant for the police department. My grandfather, Clifford Kelly, was a mathematician and an architect and worked for the uh, Corps of Engineers here in the city of Fresno to build West, to build Fresno, worked on the 41 freeway, worked on a lot of um, housing in Southwest Fresno with my paternal grandfather, uh, Fred Holly. And they all, they work to improve quality of life. But when we look at the historical perspective and how West Fresno became what it is today, it, it is steeped in the racialized policies of residential security maps, informal, informal, uh, realty compacts, and the segregation of a city. And the result of that uh, was also what we see on the next slide, slide number four. So what we see on slide number four is the outcome of redlining structural and planning inequity. For example, uh, you see that California Avenue historically has, has been home to a lot of farmland, um, incomplete pedestrian infrastructure, primarily it'll be housing, a single family housing. And these neighborhoods are butted up right against industrial, ag industrial, uh, businesses and packing houses and food processing plants. Additionally, in, in an area where we have a $6.9 billion agribusiness, we have a food desert as there is only one grocery store for the more than 26,000 residents of Southwest Fresno. So the structural inequity built by informal agreements that became policy has created generations of, of poverty, but also the structural inequity that we're seeking to correct now. And the final uh, uh, screen, the final shot is an asset map of where we are here. I'm really excited about this map because what it shows is the layering of local, state, and federal resources that are now leveraged to facilitate social and environmental justice. You know, we have the six, $66.5 million in transformative community climate funding. We have the CAN Neighborhood Planning Grant, which is phenomenal. But we also have a commitment from housing developers to build quality, decent, affordable housing, to create green jobs, to improve pedestrian infrastructure. And also we have a layering on to right, as someone said, the egregious wrongs that have taken place for decades. So I, I wanna end with this asset map. I know I have like a, a 20 seconds left on my clock, 
But I think that, that that we are in a good place. We're in a good place because this is a perfect bringing together of new policies leveraged with federal, local, and state dollars to really um, course correct and create change. And then most importantly, finally, residents are trained and empowered to be change agents and to lead this effort. So I wanna thank you all for your time today. Thank you for inviting me to speak and very excited about the work happening on California Avenue. Thank you, uh, Sabrina Kelly, that was fantastic. Uh, it, we, it, we are the embodiment of uh, Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, but we're also the embodiment of abundant community with Peter Block uh, about how we're gonna build upon the gifts and strengths of the community. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ray uh, Parks and Dr. Destiny Thomas um, for the last part of this opening session. Thanks, Preston. I am very conscious of the fact that we are already behind schedule. And so I am going to spend literally a second talking about schedule and process which really is building upon the amazing work that has preceded this grant. And for our HUD friends, really wanna double down on the fact that this is not starting from the date of the grant. The team on the ground and all these amazing partners that you see today just represent a scattering of the breadth of partnerships that the Housing Authority and the city and others have put together. But just to remind everybody, this grant is a 12 year planning cycle. We've already started. Uh, we're about three plus months in, about three months in. 12 months, you said 12 year, 12 months, about 12 years. <laughs> 24 months, I'm sorry, two years. We have a two year planning grant. And, um, but more importantly though, because so much work has been has occurred already, the work is organized into really phases. The first part of this now is about getting our arms collectively around all this amazing work that's been done before. How do we build up on that, reaffirm community priorities rather than starting over? So I want to just say that. And um, the other piece of this, though, is that, as you saw from Ms. Kelly's presentation, while there are enormous challenges here, some of them structural and historic, amazing, amazing assets, including our residents. And I think there was supposed to be a chart coming up, Tiffany. Is that coming up or am I skipping over that? <laughs> um, so here is just a quick visual. There's a steering committee that is of thought leaders. This is the group, the Housing Authority of the city and other partners have been working together for a while. There is the PE is actually people that's meant to be people. Uh, we've got a resident advisory group. There's a neighborhood committee. There is housing and real estate. And woven throughout all of this though is community engagement, sustained robust engagement, particularly adapted to the realities of COVID. And um, Thrivent is gonna speak about that. Um, and then I wanna just point out the, the data and technology piece here. We recognize at the outset that digital equity access are significant issues and barriers and in fact, this is one of the reasons one of the early action projects is um, around um, access and technology and broadband. And of course, the need for ongoing communications and support. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to our uh, team member Thrivens who will just uh, provide a highlight of the, the engagement strategy. Um, and then we will pause for questions. Thank you so much, Ray. And while I wait for my slides to come up, I will just extend a, a congratulations to the entire city of Fresno, especially Southwest Fresno. Um, I know that we've come a long way to get here. Um, I'm, I am proud and honored to be a part of this effort and to be um, tapped to be a thought partner um, in how we can continue to honor um, and dignify the experiences that you had and the work that you've already contributed to, to this process. So I'll pause for a second so we can get the slides running. 
Thank you. All right, so um, everyone has done an amazing job of giving um, a sense of Fresno's origin story, right? We've got a lot of understanding around um, what has come before, some of the issues that we're still facing, and the Thrivance Group has an origin story too. And we always tell that origin story, but I rarely get an opportunity to talk about how um, intrinsically linked the city of Fresno is to my own personal origin story. I won't go into it in detail, but I will tell you that um, when I was experiencing my lowest of lows, as a person, as a woman of color, I was living in the city of Fresno and the safety net there really showed up for me. Um, and so when I say it's an honor to be doing this work, I truly mean it. Um, I am honored to be able to give back to the city and the, and the service providers that really showed up for me when I really needed it. So um, as many people have said, this project is staffed by people that have really deep roots in the city of Fresno. Um, so is Thrivance Group, right? I lived there for my formative years. Um, several of our staff still have families that live there. And so this is personal for us. So although we've been on the ground doing deep engagement for um, over a year at this point, specifically in this project area. This is really about us building upon um, what feels very much like a lifetime of work and a lifetime of context. Um, and, and I just wanna lift up the city of Fresno's elected officials because what I've seen there is unlike what we've seen in our work in many of the larger cities that we work in, and that is an investment in the spirit of socially just development, right? So I know we've been saying access a lot, that's really important. Representation is also really important. But what I'm sensing from the city of Fresno and what our experience has been as an organization has been um, true um, intentionality um, and investment in social justice, um, which is new and which is necessary given the history that we've just come to understand about Southwest Fresno. So what we're gonna do as partners on this project is um, dig deep into tapping into the human element. And we call this a dignity infused community engagement process. Next slide, please. So one of the things that um, I, I think someone mentioned earlier, Angie mentioned this earlier, one of the things that is central to our work is that we filter everything through um, our organizational virtue, which is dignity. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what it really means to move toward and lean into the ecosystem of personhood that exists in our project area. So a lot of what I'm gonna describe in terms of our method for community engagement is rooted in concepts like um, self-determination where the ideas don't just come from community but the community has been given um, access to tools and knowledge in order to form um, meaningful ideas that we can carry forward for many generations. Um, we're also talking about doing the work of counter erasure. A lot of the legacy, of the, I think one of the reasons why everyone has spoken about the legacy of um, disenfranchisement, disinvestment, and uh, redlining in this area is because there has been a concerted effort by many people in the past um, to erase that narrative. And so we do work in a counter erasure way. And we do that by elevating the conversations that have been historically avoided. Uh, one of the ways that we do that, as was mentioned, is by really focusing on where our strengths and our assets are. Our name is the Thrivance Group. We're focused on where we're thriving. Um, and so the pictures that are here reflected on the screen are actual pictures of Fresno residents. And these are the people um, whose faces, whose work, whose needs don't uh, ri often rise to the top when we're having conversations about um, developing or revitalizing uh, the city of Fresno. Next slide. So as I mentioned, origin stories are really important to us um, and they're gonna continue to be central to our work. So the engagement strategy that we've created um, will have a lot to do with the context of not just what work came before us, 
but who came before us, right? So now within the context of COVID-19, this includes us tapping into our relationships and networks um, with folks who are doing and providing the mutual aid work. Although um, cities are, all of the cities that we live in and have worked in um, are doing their absolute best um, to show up in the ways that we need them to. Um, there are also residents who don't sit in official positions and don't have jobs and contracts who are standing in the gaps for us. So we've designed a strategy, not just for including them, but um, engaging in a way that actually bolsters and supports the efforts that they have. We're also gonna be doing a lot of work around um, lessons learned. So it's important for us, I actually specialize in, in housing history, um, and it's important for us to make sure that we're not duplicating or reproducing some of the harmful um, housing related practices and policies um, that have led to some of the disparity that we mentioned earlier today. And so what this means for us is making sure our engagement leads to homegrown innovation, not just um, asking residents to buy into and accept <clears throat> concepts that we're borrowing from other regions or geographic typologies, but really focusing on um, creating opportunities for people to self-determine uh, what transformation means for them, what meaningful transformation means for them. Um, and we're of course plugging that into our existing on the ground effort in this area um, to establish a set of anti-displacement policies for the entire city of Fresno to carry forward, um, both through this project and others. Next slide. So what does this look like? Um, there are three ways that we're tapping into this. I like alliteration too. I know we heard some A's at the beginning of our talk today. I've got some C's for you to go with choice neighborhoods. Um, and so what we're doing is we're focusing on our coalitions. There are many groups, there's resident advisory groups, there's task forces, there are the abuelas that, that just kind of have the oral history and the institutional knowledge within them. Um, and we're gonna tap into those coalitions and begin to create the engagement process um, through their eyes and, and, and support them and resource them so that they can, so that the engagement that we do and the planning effort that is underway is truly a work of their hands um, with our facilitation and guidance. We're also going to be doing capacity building. This is really important for us because we wanna make sure that the engagement that we do does not just apply to the project that we're engaging people about. We want this work to be scalable and we wanna have a timeless impact. So we're gonna be doing a lot to make sure we are transferring the knowledge and the tools that we are coming to the table with as professionals so that even Many years from now, we are maybe no longer talking about choice neighborhoods. Residents are empowered to continue to do this work and to envision the perpetual growth um, and sustainability of the communities that they live in. Um, and then lastly, we're gonna make sure that this work is culturally relevant. Of course, that means we're gonna be anchored to the historic context, but we're also gonna be anchored to the community context. And I think one of the things that gives us um, an edge in this work is that we have been by choice volunteering um, in, this, in this area for several years and working in this area more recently. And so we have a deep understanding um, of, of the, the community context that will exist uh, regardless of what project we're talking about. So we're gonna draw from that as well. Um, I do wanna mention that we are doing engagement during the pandemic. So a couple of the strategies that we plan on implementing include things like pushing into the mutual aid network that's on the ground um, and helping to expand um, the work and, and support the work of social safety net providers so that our engagement is not just, hey, here we wanna talk to you about this project that we're working on, but helping community members to see um, how this project connects to their broader notion of personhood and quality of life in the area. I believe that's the last slide that we have. I wanna thank you again for allowing us to be a part of this partnership. Um, and I'll hang on if there are any questions about our community engagement.
don't say you're on mute. I got to it. Uh, I'm having a little bit of a problem. The alliteration is supposed to only be about P words, but okay, we'll take C words and A words now. So. Oh, <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Thomas. I think that was fantastic to kind of outline a different approach that, that um, you're bringing to this process for us. Uh, not different for you, but different for us, one that's really robust and exciting. Um, uh, we want to uh, start session two at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. our time, and want to give uh, our friends from HUD uh, opportunity if you have any final questions or comments. Um, no questions at this time, just um, appreciating the approach. Uh, so my sort of expertise within the team is as a people specialist and that community and resident engagement and just really appreciated everything you said, Dr. Des, and with the, the Thrivance approach is, is definitely a model that I would like to see replicated elsewhere and um, just excited to sort of see how see how we can work work that um, system out here in Fresno and I just really appreciate the approach um, and I just also wanted to just echo what Angie had said earlier, just about the focus being the target residents um, in the public housing and that being such a key aspect, I think, uh, and, and different, I think, from, from a lot of HUD programs is the focus on making sure that the residents have not just a voice, but influence and are empowered to be um, owners of a lot of the transformation and the planning that's going to be happening in their neighborhood and in their in their homes. So thank you all. Great, thank you. Uh, Chair Jones, you wanna say the final word and then we'll cut uh, our live stream and take a little break? Absolutely, uh, thank you everyone. It's been great. And with that, we'll stop our live streaming and we'll reconvene uh, in 12 minutes, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. <laughs>